right, we are continuing our series on the great showdown, uh, God versus man. And we've come to the uh, last uh, message uh, in the series. Uh, as you uh, see, we've covered a lot of ground. We've covered a whole lot of territory. And uh, this has been uh, over my 27 years as pastor here at Bethany Baptist Church. Uh, this has been one of the, uh, I would say, deepest series that uh, I've probably preached. You know, we started out by talking about the existence of God, and that mainly dealt with uh, atheism. And uh, then we dealt with the origin of the universe, and we looked at the Big Bang, and uh, how that the Big Bang has uh, fizzled out. Uh, we talked about the creation of mankind, and in that we looked at evolution, uh, the sanctity of life and how that uh, human beings are made in the image of God and he holds all life sacred. And then we looked at the meaning of life and talked about if you uh, start off believing that you are here by accident, that you really uh, have no purpose for being here other than to live your life and die. And so we looked at the uh, meaning of life. Uh, then uh, the next two Sundays, it got really deep and really controversial, and I have to say that I probably made uh, a couple of enemies on uh, these messages, but uh, hopefully your, your enmity would not be with me, but it would be with the Word of God, because I tried to point out what the Word of God said. When we looked at the definition of marriage, uh, so we define what marriage is according to the Bible, and we see that many uh, models of marriage today are different from the Word of God. Then we looked at the whole issue of gender identity, uh, which again is a very controversial subject in our day. And so we want to close out this series uh, talking about the ravages of sin, the ravages of sin. Let us pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and Lord, we are looking at a subject that touches all of us. Lord, because all of us feel the effects and have been touched by the ravages of sin. And so, Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes this morning and let us behold wonderful things out of your law. We ask that you would give us wisdom uh, beyond the human understanding, Lord, so that we might be able to grapple with things that are found in the word of God and that you would uh, give us uh, the meaning of, of the origin of many things that we have looked at, and even today as we look at the origin of another subject. And so, Lord, now as we open your word, we invite the congregation to come and dine, the master's calling, come and dine. You can feast at Jesus' table anytime. He who fed the multitudes and turned the water into wine, come and dine, the master's calling, come and dine. Feed us, Lord, at your table. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, the premise of our series has been uh, if the problem, if the foundation has a problem, then that's going to affect the other parts of the house. And so we've been looking at beginnings and saying that if you don't understand beginnings and, and the origin of things, then it's going to knock off the rest of the house. And that's what we're seeing in our society today because we've wandered away from the origins of the Bible. Uh, we see that uh, anything goes in these days because the foundation has been destroyed. So this morning we're going to talk about the ravages of sin. And when we think about the ravages of sin, all you have to do <clears throat> is just look around you. Turn on your TV, uh, you read about ISIS, you see all kind of conflict going on around the world. Uh, we see abuse happening in homes. We see people dealing with addictions. We see divorce running rampant in our society today. We just see all type of uh, ills that are out here today. And let me just say that these are, when I talk about the ravages of sin, these are the ravages of sin. Now, it didn't start out like this because uh, when God created things, he, he, he created a perfect creation. God's creation, and, and, and saints, are, because in order for us to understand the, the, the effects of the fall, and, and let me say this, because uh, many people uh, are saying that the fall was a myth, or that it was, it was poetry, that it's not history, 
that we should not take the fall literally. But we're going to look at the fall this morning, and don't let anybody tell you otherwise. We're going to see from the word of God that, that this is something that happened, and, and it affected God's creation, the perfection of God's creation. How many times, and I'm going to show you here in a second, that God said what he created was good. Now, you go back. Uh, God said what he created was good. And, and when he said that it was good, I, I went to the uh, theological uh, dictionary of the Old Testament, theological word book of the Old Testament, and this is the uh, descriptions, the explanations for this word good. It actually comes from the Hebrew word tov, and, and these are some of the meanings that it has. Good, pleasant, beautiful, delightful, glad, joyful, precious, correct and righteous. That, you know, that, that when God made his creation and, and, and he looked at it, he said it's good, it's pleasant, it's beautiful, it's delightful, it makes one glad, it's joyful, it's precious, it's correct, and it's righteous. That when God saw his creation, and so he goes through the first chapter of the book of Genesis. Now remember all those words that I use to describe what that word good means. The land, the sea, and the vegetation. In Genesis 1.12, he said it was good. The sun, moon, and stars were good. The sea creatures and the birds were good. The animals, when he created them, was good. And then he came to the crown of his creation, the man and the woman. And when he created the man and the woman, he said it was very good. That means exceedingly good. And, and so we, we, we see that this, this perfect, pristine, unaffected creation from the very hand of God was a perfect and beautiful and delightful and righteous creation. But, but, but something happened uh, as, as we look at where we're at today. You know, if you go back, just go back. To, all right, thank you. Uh, but, but, but something happened uh, as we go on today. And, and, and we look at things around us. And we now have to ask the question, what in the world happened to everything that, that God created and he said that it was good? Yeah, I think of the song by uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire. And uh, they said, uh, something happened along the way. You know, and, and, and something affected this relationship. Something touched this relationship. What used to be happy is sad. Something happened along the way. And, and, and we look at this creation around us, and it has been affected. And so people have tried to explain, well, what in the world happened to God's creation? And we see that there are uh, several explanations for this world of evil that we see around us. Some people say, well, we don't know how it's been affected. That when you look around and you see people killing each other, when you look around and you see people uh, abusing each other, when you look around and you see people getting over on each other, we, we don't know how that came into being. So there's one school that says that we don't know where this came from. And then there's another one, uh, and, and, and these would be certain religions that will tell you, well, there's no such thing as evil. So, you know, I just say tell that to uh, somebody who just lost a loved one in a homicide, right? So they say, well, there's really no such thing as evil. And then another explanation says that it's the environment because of the, 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 the environment that, that human beings are in, that that is conducive to evil. And then here's the, the fourth one is the one that I really wanted to know because, uh, you know, we've been looking at evolution, and I really wanted to know what evolution thought about evil and how evil came into existence. 
And so, you know, when we were looking at that whole message on evolution and we studied Darwin, and, and one of the things that Darwin talked about was survival of the fittest and how that uh, there was a competition for the environment, there was a competition for food, and that the animals that couldn't keep up with the competition, they eventually died out. And so evolution says that evil actually comes from selfishness because there's this competition that's in the world, a competition for food, a competition for recognition, a competition for uh, identity. And so because there's this competition that uh, what happened, people got selfish, and in that, evil arose. But my, and, and here's the point. Here goes the whole point. So don't miss this, that as Christians, and, and that's why I love the book of Genesis, because for me, it answers a whole lot of questions. Just, just, just doing this series has answered so many questions for me that, I, that I, I thought I understood, I thought I knew, but as I got into the book of Genesis, all answers came to many questions that I had. And so you leaving this sanctuary this morning, you should not leave here wondering where evil came from. You should not leave here wondering how evil got started because we see that evil basically came from the fall. It came from Adam's and Eve's disobedience. And it says here, and the woman saw that the tree, now you remember uh, she was talking to the serpent, and the serpent was, was telling her uh, that you should doubt God's word. She said, God said we can eat of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day we eat of it, we're going to die. And, and the serpent said, you're not going to die. So the serpent was trying to get her to doubt God's word. You're not going to die. And so she eventually ate. So we have a big discussion going on on Wednesdays in Bible study, right? And one of the discussions was, and we haven't answered it yet, but was Adam standing there when she was talking to the serpent? And was Adam there when she took the fruit? Now, we know it says that when she ate it, he was with her. But uh, if, you want to come, if you want to find the answer, you need to come on out and visit us on Wednesdays, and we'll let you know. So that, that, that was a big discussion. Uh, but we see here that God said that eat, eat every tree except the one. And we see in Genesis 3, 6, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. There you go. There you go, right there. You, you want to know where evil came from? You want to know where sin originate, originated? You don't have to go to Darwin and look at his theory about the survival of the fittest. You don't have to go to some religions that tell us that there's no evil in the world. You don't have to go to those that will tell you it's the environment. You don't even have to go to those who say we don't know where it came from. Right here. This was the start of evil. And God's perfect, his perfect creation was now affected. And God's creation became perverted because now up until this point and, and, and this absolutely blows my mind uh, when, when you think about the fact that up until this point Adam and Eve knew only good they experienced only good and they chose to do only good can, can you imagine a, a world where, where, where there's no temptation there's, there's no wrong there's no evil going on you know, I was leaving the church uh, yesterday, and I was uh, uh, went up uh, Tioga, turned on the oak wood, on the wood, and there was a, a group of kids on bicycles, and there was about six or seven of them, and they just started riding in front of my car and other cars, and then it, it, it then you know because I was driving, I was able to uh, you know move around and, and get ahead of them, but. They came and they just kept riding. And they rode right through every light. And I said to myself, 
Because I, I, I came to Penn Avenue and I was a little bit in front of them and I had to stop. And I said, I know these kids are not going to ride across Penn Avenue without looking. And do you know every last one of them did? Every last one. And there was cars screeching on, I'm talking, on Penn Avenue, blowing the horn, and these kids didn't care. And I thought to myself, man, I really thought to myself, what would make these kids as bold, first of all, to ride in front of people's cars, and secondly, to, to go through every light when you don't know what is coming, what car is coming, and then, like I said, Penn Avenue. And you know the traffic that's on Penn Avenue. And they just kept riding. And I thought to myself, this, back to this message that I'm preaching. The fall. The fall. What makes you, you know, I mean, you know, we can try to, you know, say, well, you know, they thought they was bad, you know, or, or, or you know, they was trying to prove a point. Or I don't know, maybe there was, maybe they had a little contest be going, going on between them playing chicken, you know, to see, you know, who would chicken out. I don't know. But, the bottom line is the answer is the fall. Is the fall. See, if, if, if they were in a healthy, let's put it, if they were in an Edenic state, if they were in the same state that Adam was in, that wouldn't even be an issue. But the fall has corrupted. And so uh, these individuals uh, riding on the bikes yesterday, I'm sure they had to know. Now, how many people here don't know? You, you can take this, one of the smallest child that's been exposed to any type of uh, traffic light system, and they're going to know on red, you stop, and on green, you go. And so these kids, they had to know the difference between green and red. They had to know. They experienced because they were riding through the lights. They experienced a choice between doing the right thing and doing the wrong thing. And they chose to do the wrong thing. Well, can you imagine Adam and Eve? They, th there was no choice for them before the fall. Absolutely no choice. Because they, all they did was good. They knew only good. They experienced only good. And they chose only good. In God's beautiful creation. And so uh, when we look at the damage that the fall did, now human beings have an awareness between good and evil. And a lot of times they choose the evil. What are, what's the produce? What's the produce of the creation that failed? I use the word scar, that it was scar. We see, first of all, there was separation from God. Look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 10. There was separation from God after the fall. God in verse 9, the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where are you? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree where I, uh, I commanded thee that thou should not eat? Who told you you were naked? There was this fellowship between God that was broken and the first sign of the fellowship that had been broken is that man went and hid himself from God can you imagine in the garden that Adam and God walked in in openness there was an openness between God and Adam and then all of a sudden in the fall, this openness is affected and Adam and Eve hide themselves. And you know what? Mankind has been hiding himself from God ever since. If you think about your life, what skeletons 
uh, do you have in your closet? What things have you tried to hide over the years? But you know what? Even in the case of Adam, you can't hide it from God because he knows all. He sees all. But the first thing that happened is that man was separated from God. And then we see now he has to wear clothes. And you know, that's, when, you, when you think about uh, the fact that, uh, as I said, that openness, where man didn't even need clothes, that it says that they were uh, naked. And earlier in the book of Genesis, it says they were naked and they were not ashamed. Absolutely no shame at all. And yet and still, you know, some people today, uh, they go back to that verse where it says they were naked and not ashamed and look at TV and look at the magazines, look at the movies, right? There's a lot of people today that's naked and unashamed. So we see it, you know, in our society. But there was something about the awareness that came to Adam and Eve where now it arises within them the fact that this is not right. This is not right. And so shame and guilt came upon them. And now they have to start wearing clothes. You see, the next thing is that there is agony in childbirth that before, I don't know if there was going to be pain or not uh, in childbirth. You know, some, I heard one lady saying, that when she gets to heaven, the first person that she's going to look for is Eve. <laughs> she's going to look for Eve. And, and, she, and she's going to confront her in heaven. Uh, because she, she's going to say, you know what? I, I don't know how many kids that this lady had, but just having one. You know, and going through that pain. But, but that, that is a result of the curse. That there is pain in childbirth. We see he lost his righteousness. That he no longer had the righteousness that God created him with. This, this innocence, this sinlessness, now was gone. It was wiped away. One of the devastating things is that he was removed from the garden. Look at Genesis chapter 3. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground where he was taken. So the Lord, or so he drove out the man. He drove him out of the garden of Eden and placed at the east of the garden of Eden the cherub and the flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. This perfect environment that Adam and Eve experienced, now they were driven out of it. So not only were they, they driven out of it, but we see that now the environment is even cursed. The environment is cursed, that the world around us is cursed. Look at Romans. Chapter 8, Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, let's read verse 21. And it says here, because the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain until now. So even creation is groaning. The environment has been affected. And then the final thing we see, the D, it means death. That all have sinned that death has passed upon every individual. So when you look at this, God's perfect creation now is scarred. It's scarred. Separation from God. All these things happen 
clothing thou worn, agony in childbirth and labor, righteousness lost, removed from the garden, environment cursed, death to all mankind because of the fall. The fall was devastating. It went from this perfect environment, this perfect, pristine environment. Now, I'm not sure if, if, if the, the picture on the right happened all of a sudden, but eventually, this is what a cursed creation looks like. And so they leave the garden head down and ashamed. God's creation fell before the, before the fall, the wolf had a calm, peaceful nature. But what happened? The fall affected the wolf and made him vicious and made him uh, a terror. You know, when you think about Isaiah said, uh, the lion and the lamb uh, in that day, in a future day, they will lay down together. But you know if they lay down together now, it's gonna be lamb chops. Right? <laughs> You put, you put the lion and the lamb. Man, if, if you ever watch these National Geographic uh, uh, presentations where these lions are running down zebras and running down uh, baby giraffes and stuff like that, it, it's vicious, it's brutal. And, and, and what causes them to have this terroristic nature inside? What causes them to be these individuals that will just tear through another animal? My brothers and sisters, we need to see the effects of the fall. God's creation. In the beauty of God's creation, the rose was a pristine flower. No thorns or thistles in the rose. And after the fall, God said, now thorns and thistles shall be incorporated into my creation. Boy, you would think that what man did would only affect himself, but it affected all of creation. The seeds were calm. Firmament was divided from the, the, the waters below and the waters above. There was a the firmament, there was a divide, and it was a peaceful experience for those upon this earth. But now somebody said, well, why do we have hurricanes and tornadoes and tsunamis? Why is that? I'm going to tell you why it is, my brothers and sisters. It's because of a fall. The fall. We just read it in Romans that all of creation is groaning because of what one man and one woman did. I'm not glad as I look around at what I see, but at least one thing I can say I know how it happened. I know how it happened. I don't have to question or wonder. I know how it happened. It wasn't a myth. It wasn't a, uh, it wasn't poetry. But as the movie we saw, it was history. Before the fall, that first couple had bodies that were perfect. Before the fall, the first couple had a relationship where everything was cool, where they got along. And the, before the fall, they, they lived in, as I said, this pristine environment. But now we look around and we see the ravages of the fall. And whenever I look at somebody that's dealing with an addiction and they're strung out on, on drugs, the one thing that comes to my mind, ah, Adam got you. Adam got you because it says as by one man sin and by one man that sin was passed down. Fall. When you look at starvation around the world and, and you see little babies with, with, with stomachs big because they, their blood, they haven't eaten anything. 
That's because of the fall. You know, we can look around and say that this regime is oppressing or that regime is oppressing, and that might be true, but it all goes back to the fall. We look around, we see graves, we see coffins. We see coffins of that big, and we see coffins over six foot long. Death has affected everyone. You can't turn on your TV and watch the morning news and not hear about it. Somebody that has died. Somebody that has died. And you know what? No matter how it happened, you turn it on. You know, sometimes you turn on the local news and all you hear is bang, 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 bang. Report after report after report about somebody who got killed, whether it was by accident or whether it was by intentional intentionality no matter what the case is you hear about people that are dying and you look at that and the first thing that should come to our minds no matter how sad it is no matter how it happened it goes back to the fall it goes back to the fall put a lady up there put a lady up there giving birth so if any of y'all getting ready to have a baby or you just have one, and you've experienced any pain, just blame it on the fall. All goes back to the fall. Relationships. Why, why, why is there trouble in relationships? You know, we can have all of the counseling in the world. And, and I, you know, we have a biblical counseling center here, and I truly believe that the word of God, that biblical counseling, that counseling can help people and straighten them out. But it all happens. Because of the fall. Because of the fall. And so just look. Look, look. look what's happened. We live in this fallen world. And, 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 and so we need not be surprised when, when things happen. And, 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 and we need not be surprised when sinners sin. Because that's their resume. Their resume is the sin. So it shouldn't shock us. Somebody said the only way that you can live above sin is to rent an apartment above alcoholic. That's the only way. You can't live above it. I know that. Uh, you can't live above it. It's, we're, we're in a sin laden world. And every day when we look in the mirror, we're looking at someone who praise God, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that, that, that he has given you help in this world to live a life to overcome and be victorious. Other than that, just think about all the other people in the world that don't know Christ and think about what they do. You know, you look at the most righteous individual in the world apart from Christ, and they still got issues. They still got issues. And it's because of the fall. I hope I painted a picture this morning. Because I really want us to see how devastating the fall actually was. And that the consequences affect all of us. And, 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 and touches all of our lives. But, you know, when I think about this right here, poor lion, right? He just bound his head, you know, he just said, not my fault, not my fault. And it wasn't the lion's fault. You know, the fact that the lion now has a ferocious nature and wants to devour other things, hey, it's not the lion's fault. I saw, I read this in uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Now, this is in the Message Bible. Now, I know that there are some here this morning that struggle with the message, all right, because it's a paraphrase. It's not a translation. So I understand that. But I just thought some of the word pictures that came out in the message kind of typifies what the fall represents. So let, let's, let, let me read this. It is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time, all right? The fall, the fall. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, 
a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness. The fall, the fall, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all consuming yet never satisfied wants, a brutal temper, and impotent to love or to be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community. And in the message, Eugene Peterson translating this passage says, and I could go on, and I could go on. What a list! What a list! That, just look at that list. That's what we see today. We see it today. There's no question about that. And it all stems from the fall. It all stems from the fall. But thank God. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 21 through 22. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ, all shall all be made alive. Thank God for the second Adam. Thank God for the second Adam. Because we see what the first Adam messed up. The second Adam straightened out. Have you ever uh, has, had a problem in your house and you tried to work on the problem and uh, you just made it worse? Uh, can I get a witness? <laughs> can I get a witness? All right. And then you finally, <laughs> you finally call somebody, right? Jimmy. <laughs> to, to, to look at it and they come and they say, man, who in the world? <laughs> the world worked on this. <laughs> I'm laughing right now. <laughs> because they look, man, this is all, I, got, I got to straighten out a mess here. And, and that's what the second Adam did. There was a mess. And the second Adam straightened it out. The first Adam committed a sinful act of disobedience. The second Adam committed an act of righteous obedience when he died on the cross. Amen. The first Adam brought sin and death. The second Adam brought righteousness and life. The first Adam brought judgment. The second Adam brought justification. The first Adam, he, 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 Adam, he was right with God. He was in a right relationship with God. When he sinned, he got in a wrong relationship with God. When the second Adam came, he put him back in a right relationship with God. The first Adam brought judgment. The second Adam brought justification. The first Adam brought a curse. The second Adam brought a blessing. The first Adam brought bondage. The second Adam brought liberty. Thank God that he didn't leave us caught up in the ravages of sin. Thank God for that. Two paintings, or a painting and a sculpture. Rembrandt, Rembrandt did a famous painting called the Night Watch, uh, which is known around the world. Michelangelo sculptured a statue called the Pieta, which was uh, Mary holding, now we know that uh, this is not necessarily biblical, so I don't want anybody to walk out here thinking that it's biblical. But, but uh, Mary holding Jesus, you know, after he was taken down uh, off the cross. The Night Watch uh, over in Amsterdam, a museum. Somebody came in with a knife and just began to hack away at it, tear away at it, and just, just brutalize the painting. In St. Peter's Cathedral, somebody came in with a hammer 
and began to bust up the pieta and just began to chip it all apart. And eventually, in both cases, they caught the guy while in the act of doing it. And in both cases, they brought in experts, experts in the field of art, one in paintings and the other in sculpting. And after much time, they were almost able to completely restore these two pieces back to the original. They took the expert and brought them in and got it almost back to the original. Well, let me tell you, there was an enemy. His name was Satan. And he came in the form of a serpent. And he had a knife, and he had a hammer. And he was ripping, and he was pounding. And he destroyed God's creation. And God said, wait a minute. Let me go get the experts. <laughs> and he went, and he got his son, Jesus Christ, who came and lived on this earth for 30-some years, was hung up on the cross, died, was buried, and rose again. And the expert came. And he didn't get us all the way back to perfect, but he got us a long way from where we were at. Thank God that sin might have had its ravages. But God brought in the expert. And God is working on us. And then we know one day, one day there will be a perfect restoration of this painting and of this sculpture. And that is when we see our Lord face to face because we will be like him for we shall see him as he is Lord we come to you this morning and Lord even though sin the fall has ravaged your creation yet and still Lord you were thinking ahead and you sent your son to die on a cross for our sin that we might have eternal life. And Lord, I pray that if there's one here today that has never received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, as we give the invitation this morning, that they might come. Speak to their hearts this morning, Lord, and allow them to come and meet with one of our counselors who will open up the word of God and show them how to become a child of God. Lord, maybe there's someone here today that's looking for a church home. And this is the place where you have led them. We pray, Heavenly Father, that they might come as we give the invitation today and see what they have to do to unite with this local fellowship. And so, Lord, we commit this invitation to you now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us stand as we sing together how great is our God. Is there one today? Would you come? Would you come?